how do you get teenagers to talk about their emotions, right? That there's a heavy interest in getting teenagers to talk about their emotions. And there's value. And we'll talk about that in a minute. At nine o'clock at night, I have a kid standing in front of me saying, hi, I'm angry, upset, frustrated, unhappy. Usually I'm like, really? Like now? <laughs> right? Like, So I don't know about you, but I had one of those moments the other day. You know, when you're sitting at the kitchen table, scrolling through your phone, and out of nowhere, your teenager walks in, grabs a snack, and walks out without saying a word. And you just sit there wondering, when did I become invisible? And then it hit me. I used to be the person they told everything to. Now it's like I'm lucky if I get a few grunts and a half-hearted fine when I ask how their day was. I mean, anyone else feel like you're standing on the outside of your own kid's life, just waiting to be let back in? Well, today, we're going to dig into that. We're going to explore what's really going on with the teens in our lives. And trust me, it's not just about figuring them out. It's about rethinking how we connect with them. There's a lot more beneath the surface than we realize, and the answers might surprise you. I'm going to start with sort of the conventional beginning, which is why I wrote this book. Um, I wasn't, there goes a balloon. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I have no idea where it came from. <laughs> um, okay, so back to the conventional of why I wrote this book. You going to get it? I know. You got, all right. All right. Fantastic. Um, there are two major forces behind the impetus to write this book. First of all, obviously, was the pandemic. I have cared for teenagers for nearly 30 years now, and I don't have to tell you, I have never seen anything like that in terms of its impact on teenagers. Actually, all of us, but teenagers in particular. Um, teenagers have two jobs. They're supposed to become increasingly independent and to spend as much time with their friends as possible. And the pandemic undermined their ability to do either of these jobs. That was the least of what teenagers suffered with. Then, of course, there was incredible diversity in how teenagers suffered, some suffering much more than others. And of course, kids who were already living under difficult conditions or in highly strained families suffered the most. The second reason I wrote this book had to do with something that was happening before the pandemic and that it seemed to accelerate through the pandemic, which is that there was a growing, there still is a growing chasm between how the popular culture talks about what mental health is and how psychologists understand mental health. And what I mean by that is that so often in the discourse, whether it's the newspapers or social media, so often what I see equated is this idea that you know you're mentally healthy or you know your kid's mentally healthy if there's a sense of feeling good or calm or relaxed or at ease. Um, happiness also comes up a lot now. And psychologists like these things. We have nothing against people feeling good or calm or relaxed or happy, but they actually don't figure into how we assess mental health and how we think about it. When psychologists think about mental health, we're actually looking at two things. One is whether the feelings that are being had actually fit the circumstance the person is in, even if those feelings are negative or unwanted. So that's the first assessment. The second is, how are the feelings managed? Are they managed in ways that bring relief and do no harm, or are they managed in ways that actually turn out to be problematic? To use a very you know, sort of straightforward example, Imagine that your teenager has a dear best friend and they, I, I'm aware, I'm actually gonna take a quick pause on the technical stuff. Are you all hearing as much feedback as I'm hearing? Okay, do you think it's because I have two mics up here? Okay, I just wanna make sure if there's something you need me to do. Okay, so you'll sort it out. I just wanted to make sure that that was good. All right, so to take a very straightforward example, imagine a teenager who has a dear best friend and they hang out all the time and they love each other and they're just, you know, together constantly. And then the teenager gets the news that their fr best friend is moving away. Okay, we would expect to see sadness. We would fully expect that there would be an upset young person in this moment. We would never in that moment take that distress as a sign that something was wrong with that young person. We would actually see it as evidence that they work perfectly. So that's check the first box, the feeling that fits the moment. 
Second, there's the question of how does the feeling get handled? And for psychologists, this is really where the rubber hits the road. This is what we're going to want to assess. So the kinds of things that we want to see are adaptive strategies that bring relief and do no harm. So for us, that means things like weeping, like actually psychologists like crying. Um, crying actually brings relief, calms the central nervous system, is a low cost, actually no cost way to manage stress. Um, we would want to see things, if it's a teenager especially, you'll see things like they'll put on their sad playlist and cry along to it. I promise you, most teenagers have a sad playlist and an angry playlist. And I was recently collecting um, playlist names from teenagers on the negative side, and one kid was like, I have a low-key devious playlist. <laughs> and I was like, good for you, good for you. So they'll listen to music that helps them express the negative feeling. Um, she may then want to take a break from feeling upset and get a little rest from it. So she might go watch some TV. She's probably going to go watch right now, go watch Gilmore Girls. Like Gilmore Girls is back. It was, it was Gilmore Girls and then Grey's and now we're back to Gilmore Girls. So that's often watched. And then she might make plans to get together with a friend. And all of these are what we want to see. This is exactly what mental health looks like, having a feeling that makes sense and then managing it well. We only get concerned if the management of the emotion is problematic. So we only get concerned if coping is costly. So we worry about a teenager who gets very upset and is like, you know what, the solution is to smoke a ton of weed until this feeling dies down, right? That will work in the short term, cause all sorts of trouble down the line. We worry about teenagers who routinely manage to stress by making everybody else upset, right? If I'm miserable, we're all going to be miserable. And they sort of take it out in that way. And we worry about teenagers who turn against themselves when they're in distress, dislike themselves, don't take good care of themselves, or harmful to themselves. So we think in those ways about what we're looking for when we talk about mental health. And I was so honored to be invited under the umbrella of wellness for this theme for this year. Because the way psychologists define wellness isn't how I think people often expect us to define wellness. It's not for us about being peaceful, being at ease, being happy, being relaxed. It's about having the capacity to manage distress effectively, having your resources, your emotional resources equal to the emotional tax that you run into. Okay, so the key here is to actually tease apart the experience of being in distress from the experience of having a mental health concern. And I wanna spend some time on things that need to be teased apart now more than ever. One thing that we are all watching unfold in front of us is a very interesting media landscape about adolescence and mental health. It is covered constantly. It is covered in ways that are at times harrowing. And one of the things I am always aware of as I watch these headlines come one after another is how often distress and mental health concern are spoken about as though they are the same. So one thing we wanna just be really, really clear about in our own minds is that distress on its own is not something psychologists consider to be grounds for a mental health concern. In fact, and this is gonna feel like a leap, but the examples are very straightforward. For us, often, distress is evidence of mental health. So in fact, 180 from much of the cultural discourse. So for example, best friends moving away, we expect to see sadness. Sadness is distress, it fits the moment perfectly. Another kind of easy example is, um, say a kid has a huge test in a day or two and they have not started studying we would want to see anxiety under those conditions. We would be more concerned about the absence of anxiety than its presence. Similarly, if someone's really mean to a kid, we would expect that kid to feel hurt and then feel kind of self-protectively angry. So for psychologists, we're actually surprisingly agnostic on whether an emotion is negative or positive, like that doesn't really matter much to us. What we're interested in is how well it fits the circumstance and so often we truly welcome distress into our lives and the lives of the young people we care for because we know that it fits the picture and is evidence that that young person works perfectly. You know, as I'm listening to this, I can't help but think about how often we as adults try to avoid or fix these emotional moments. Whether it's tears, frustration, or just plain silence, there's this instinct to jump in and try to make things better. I've done it so many times myself, rushing in with solutions or trying to calm things down. 
But here's something I've learned over the years. Emotions aren't always problems that need solving. Sometimes they're just moments that need to be felt. It's easy to forget that our teens are still learning how to navigate their emotions just like we are. And the best thing we can do isn't to fix things for them, but to show them that it's okay to sit with those feelings. It's okay to cry, to be frustrated, to not have it all together. What matters is that we're there, letting them know they don't have to figure it all out on their own. This has been one of the most powerful lessons for me, not always offering advice or solutions, but simply being present and letting my teen know that their emotions, no matter how big, are valid. That's how we help them build resilience, by showing them that we're there for the messy parts too. I've been thinking about something as we go through this conversation, how much pressure we, as parents or mentors, put on ourselves to get everything right. We're constantly trying to navigate this maze of emotions, strategies, and techniques, hoping that we're doing enough to help our teens thrive. And it's exhausting, isn't it? But something I've come to realize is that it's okay to not have all the answers. It's okay to be unsure sometimes. The goal isn't perfection. It's about being present, being open, and most importantly, being compassionate with ourselves. Because here's the thing. Our kids are watching how we handle our own challenges, and they're learning from us. When we show them that it's okay to be vulnerable, to ask for help, or to admit when we're struggling, we're teaching them resilience in a way that no lecture ever could. As I listened to Dr. Lisa DeMore reflections, one thought kept coming to mind. We often think of raising teens as this uphill battle, a constant struggle to connect and get through to them. And yes, it's tough. There's no denying that. But what we don't talk about enough is how much we grow in the process of raising and mentoring teens. So to tease this apart a little further, distress versus mental health concern, we should articulate exactly what constitutes a mental health concern. So psychologists worry under a couple of conditions. One, not if mood goes up and down in a teenager, we fully expect to see that, but if mood goes to a concerning place and stays there, we don't expect to see that. And we don't expect that dark mood or that anxious mood to get in the way of a young person's life. So we expect sadness, we expect nerves, we do not expect so much sadness or so much anxiety that it interferes with going to school or seeing friends or doing the things that you're supposed to do. So that's when we know there's a mental health concern on board. And then of course, the other kind that we worry about is when coping is costly. A young person is managing but the way they are managing is gonna cause trouble over time, whether they're abusing substances, being hard on others, or being hard on themselves. Okay, so that's one thing to tease apart. Now, there's another thing that we wanna tease apart that very much reflects the moment where we are culturally, which is we do not want to equate uncomfortable and unmanageable. And these are categories that have increasingly been collapsed around us. Okay. So there's many reasons why we do not want to equate these two things, uncomfortable and unmanageable. The first is that if we equate the two, if anything that is seen as uncomfortable is considered to be unmanageable, the almost invariable upshot of that is that you're going to see a lot of avoidance, right? That thing is uncomfortable. I cannot manage it. I'm not going to do it. Interesting to me, as I watch these headlines after headlines after headlines about teenagers, What I'm not seeing are the headlines about the thing I'm really hearing about, which is kids not going to school now. If you talk to any district across every socioeconomic range, what they will tell you is that they've had an enormous surge in chronic absenteeism, school truancy, school refusal, like it goes by different names. Now, why kids aren't going to school differs based on the child, differs based on their circumstances, but this is actually... I think in some ways the untold story of the post-pandemic world is that a lot fewer kids are actually showing up physically at school. For a lot of these kids, not all of these kids, the issue is avoidance, that they have come to feel that school is uncomfortable and so then it feels for them unmanageable and then they don't go. 
So one thing that I all want you, I want you all to know, and this is just me talking as a psychologist, is that one of the most fundamental concepts that is fully established in our field is that avoidance feeds anxiety. And if I could rent billboards and airplanes with banners behind them, this is what I would put up on the billboards. Avoidance feeds anxiety, avoidance feeds anxiety. All right, here's how this works. If any one of us, but we'll center on a young person, let's say a teenager is feeling anxious about socializing. So we'll keep it away from school for a minute. And let's say that teenager has been invited to an event that they should go to, right? It's a friend's party, someone they like, you know, it's a totally reasonable thing to do. And let's say they feel anxious about it. So maybe they've accepted the invitation, but then the day comes and their anxiety starts to rise. And then let's say that teenager says, you know what, never mind, I'm just not going to go, right? And the adult on the scene says, okay, fine, it's a party, you don't have to go. All right, two things happen instantly that are a big problem. The first thing is the teenager instantly feels way better, right? As they were thinking about the party, they're getting more and more anxious, more and more concerned. And then they're like, where I just don't go. Whoosh, the anxiety drains away. All right, you all know this intro psych. This is a reinforcing experience, right? You're going to want to do it again because it felt so good. The second thing that happens is that whatever they were imagining about how bad or scary or frightening or worrisome that party was going to be, is now sealed in amber. They don't actually show up and see that, oh, it's not so bad, or it's fine, or you know, I know a few people and I don't mind talking to them. It just stays totally unchallenged by reality. Okay, now, if the thing they've avoided is school, a third thing happens, and it happens fast. As soon as a kid misses like literally a day of school, they are out of the loop a bit socially and they are out of the loop a bit academically which makes it that much harder to go to school the next day. So avoidance feeds anxiety under any condition and actually feeds itself. The more you avoid, the more you avoid. And then for school, it's actually an accelerated process. Okay, so just as the principle is incredibly well understood in psychology, like there's no debate about this in our field, the treatment is also very, very much agreed upon. The technical term we use is exposure, Basically, you got to go. You got to go. And we use graduated exposure, meaning you don't have to go all at once. You could also use the term baby steps. So anytime you or someone you know is using avoidance to manage anxiety, the key thing you want to remember is it's going to make it worse very, very quickly. And the solution is actually to engage. And that may mean going to the first period and then going home, right? Or hanging out in the parking lot with an adult until you feel you can go in the building. But any degree of engagement is actually more powerful and more effective than staying home. Okay, so that's the first problem with collapsing unmanageable and uncomfortable is that we see too much avoidance and we're seeing a lot right now. The second problem when you collapse the two is it actually doesn't honor people who are in truly unmanageable situations. And this is something I think about a lot as a psychologist, because I observe how the culture has come to use technical and clinical terms in pretty elastic ways. And I try not to be too fussy about this and seem like a curmudgeon, but I always like feel myself bristle when the term trauma is thrown into a conversation. And mostly I try to be forgiving about it. Like, you know what, people are allowed to use words, like they're not all psychologists, they don't have to have the strict technical definitions that we use. But you do hear trauma used quite a bit to talk about an uncomfortable thing or an unwanted thing. And I'll live with that. But I also, I'm not gonna let you leave without you knowing exactly how psychologists define it and when we use it and why we use it. So for us, trauma is never the thing, it's never the event. Trauma is the interaction of the event and who it landed on. Because what will traumatize one person might not traumatize another. And we've known this for decades, the way we've studied this, looking at people coming back from war, people who've been in the same platoon going through the same horrible situation. Some will come back fully traumatized, other will come back very, very upset. And for us, trauma is an event that outmatches the coping of the individual to whom the event occurs. That's what a trauma is. So we can't really ever call anything a trauma, though there are some things that are bad enough that we just go ahead and do it. 
because we need to know who they landed on. Okay, so why does this matter? If we call everything that is uncomfortable unmanageable, we are actually losing track of the fact that some people really do live under unmanageable situations, and we're losing fat track of that reality. That can either be people who are facing traumas, right, that totally outmatch their coping, or things that are so overwhelming they would outmatch anybody's coping, so we can go ahead and assume they are traumatic. Or it can be people who are up against subtler and more constant things, the drip, drip, drip of racism or prejudice or bias that over time absolutely wears down coping. We want to be always thinking in terms of coping and who it's happening to and how it's happening and scale. And so when we collapse those, when we equate uncomfortable and unmanageable, we actually make two errors at once. First, we actually talk in general about people as though they're more fragile than they are. Humans are actually built to withstand a surprising amount of distress. And second, we really do not honor the fact that there are some individuals who actually face incredibly harrowing circumstances, big and overwhelming ones, or who live under situations that are chronically stressful and harmful and that are gonna undo them over time. I completely agree with this point about not losing sight of those who are truly in unmanageable situations. It's something we don't always stop to consider, how quickly we can label discomfort as trauma when in reality, there are people experiencing ongoing stress that far surpasses everyday challenges. And honestly, I've been guilty of this myself. What really stands out to me is how easily the term trauma gets thrown around in our conversations and how that can actually undermine those who are facing real, life-altering events. It's not about denying that people have tough moments or days, but when we blur the line between discomfort and true trauma, we risk not seeing the depth of what some individuals are truly going through. I think this is a reminder for all of us to be more mindful of the words we use and to consider the weight they carry. For me, it's also about paying closer attention to the quieter struggles, those subtle long-term stresses like systemic bias or chronic hardship, which often go unnoticed. If we're not careful, we overlook the people who are enduring these more invisible forms of pressure. And recognizing those experiences is key to offering the right kind of support. You know, this really makes me think about how often we underestimate the resilience people have in the face of adversity. I've seen it in so many situations where what one person might call trauma is really just a bad day, while others are living through situations that would push anyone to their limit. And it's easy to forget that. But the point here is important. By equating discomfort with something truly unmanageable, we run the risk of not seeing the people who are dealing with overwhelming chronic stress, the kind that can wear someone down over time. This is where we need to be more thoughtful about the words we use and more compassionate toward those who are quietly facing situations we might not even realize. It's a reminder for all of us to pause, listen, and pay attention. Sometimes the people who need the most support aren't the ones shouting about their struggles. They're the ones dealing with the drip, drip, drip of stress, bias, or hardship that slowly wears them down over time. And recognizing that difference, that's where we can start to make a real impact. Okay, now there's another tension that I want us to think through as we try to navigate the moment in adolescent mental health. And this is something I also am just observing all the time. There's the tension of wanting to call all of our you know, focus to the fact that we are in an adolescent mental health crisis, right? You, this is in the news, we are talking about it. It is very, very real. And we are seeing headline after headline about the adolescent mental health crisis. But the thing we also have to be careful about is not to overwhelm people so much that they become paralyzed, right? That the data don't actually start to flood us and cause us to shut down or want to avoid the situation ourselves. 
And I think it's tricky. I think that this can be a really difficult tension to manage. And sometimes we get data that are very, very concerning and we need to share them, but we also want people to stay engaged and to stay involved. So the way that I think about managing this tension is to try to bring a public health lens to it. And I'm gonna walk you through what I mean. But the reason that I like a public health lens is I feel like it does two things at once. Number one, it keeps me from feeling overwhelmed. If you spend all day thinking about adolescent mental health and reading the papers, it's pretty easy to start to feel overwhelmed. Second, the public health lens means that every one of us in this room has a job to do. So you're leaving with jobs to do. Okay, so to describe the public health lens, I find it's easier for me to wrap my hands around it if I don't think about mental health but actually, if I think about dental health, truly, okay. So if we think in a dental health perspective on public health, we think in primary, secondary, and tertiary forms of prevention, and I'm actually gonna start with tertiary. So tertiary describes when there's already a problem and then it needs to be fixed and kept from getting worse. So in dental terms, it's a cavity, right? So if a young person has a cavity, Tertiary prevention, you fill the cavity, you make sure it doesn't get worse, you get that tooth back to health. Secondary prevention is where there's a risk of a problem developing. So maybe a kid who's eating a ton of sweets. And so in dental health, secondary prevention, we notice kids who are actually bending towards ill health and we actually try to redirect them. Primary prevention in public health terms when we think in terms of dental health, is fluoride in the water, right? That there's something that we do that goes to everyone to try to protect their overall health. Okay, so that's our dental health version of this. Cavities, cavity prevention for kids who are at high risk, fluoride for everybody. So if we take that and we move it over to mental health, it's just an accident that they rhyme, but it's, I appreciate it. Let's think first about the tertiary side of this equation. So tertiary are what do we do for kids who are already suffering from mental health concerns? And we have a lot of kids suffering from mental health concerns. And it gets us to something that, again, has not gotten discussed very much as we talk about the crisis in adolescent mental health. There were really two causes of it. One was the surge in distress among teenagers, right? The pandemic was horrible. It made many teenagers who were fine completely unhappy and kids who were struggling really into some pretty dire and scary circumstances. So we had this huge uptick in terms of how many kids were suffering. The undiscussed side of this is we don't actually have a lot of people who see teenagers. This is highly, highly specialized work. Not everybody is interested in it. And to do it, you actually need a lot of training because teenagers are tricky and you're working across different systems and you're, they're not quite adults and they're not quite kids and they're brought in by adults, but you can't tell them things. I mean, it's, it's a complicated clinical world. And so the thing that didn't get nearly enough coverage as we're talking about the adolescent mental health crisis is we don't have a workforce that can actually meet the need. The workforce for caring for teenagers was actually pretty stretched thin before the pandemic. And it wasn't as though when the pandemic hit, we could magically like produce thousands of new people who were seasoned at seeing teenagers. So if we think now about tertiary concerns and kids who are already struggling, there's a couple of things for us to focus on. So one is, I know we have some students in the room. And what I wanna say to you is, if you're thinking about caring for teenagers for a living, let me recommend it. Right? I adore them, they are incredibly fun to treat. And the best thing about teenagers is they get better faster than anybody else. The wonder of caring for teenagers, and one of my colleagues said this, he's like, you know what? We get way too much credit for our work with teenagers. And it is true. I have cared for teenagers who in October were cut in class, didn't care about anything, deep into all sorts of trouble, who, Truly, with not a lot of work on my part, something shifts, something realigns, they get an idea about what they want to have happen next in their life, and suddenly they are deep into school or deep into an activity that they can take and that's going to be a real rudder for them as they move forward in life. So I strongly recommend on the tertiary side that we think very much about encouraging more and more people to move into the work of caring for teenagers and helping them to be good clinicians in that place. 
The other thing we can do, and this is for those of us who are already in the field, we have to think very, very hard about the pipeline of clinicians of color. One of the things we are always lacking in number, and then I think became even more dire in the pandemic, is enough clinicians who have lived experience that can reflect the needs of our very diverse clientele. And there are a lot of leaks in the pipeline for clinicians of color, and one of the things those of us who are in the field can be doing is thinking very, very hard about how do we plug those leaks, how do we get more clinicians into the pipeline so that we can de deliver more clinicians of color down the line. Okay, the second thing we're gonna do, this is into secondary prevention. This is the dental health, eating too many sweets, mental health, when it's time to start worrying about somebody, is we are not gonna equate distress with a mental health concern. We're not doing that. We are gonna be very alert to the signs that something's wrong. Okay, so how do you know something is starting to bend in a worrisome direction with a teenager? So one, like I said, recognize mood that is stuck in a place that it shouldn't be, right? It's not going up and down. Two, as I mentioned, recognizing costly coping. And primarily, I want you to add into your awareness of what costly coping is, avoidance. We're not spending nearly enough time, I think, getting on avoidance early when we see it. And as soon as avoidance starts, it quickly grows. So part of what we can do as adults who surround teenagers is to have a very, very watchful eye for coping that is problematic or kids whose moods are not varying or as they should. The other thing I want to add here, and this feels to me like, again, if I could have all the billboards in the world, I would also get this billboard. One thing we want to be mindful of is that depression in teenagers does not always look like depression in adults. And this is something that a lot of people don't know. Some teenagers do have a more kind of classical depression where they look low mood or blank um, or lacking in all motivation. Teenagers uniquely will express depression in terms of being very, very irritable or angry or short-tempered or impatient with people. And it is very common that a teenager who is depressed to me, when I've cared for them clinically, either on inpatient or outpatient work, what they feel like is a porcupine. Like, if you get near them, you're always going to run into something spiky and uncomfortable. And I sort of feel like us in the world of trying to be public health stewards of young people, if you could help me get the word out that a teenager who is prickly with their parents, prickly with their school, prickly with their siblings, doesn't even, you know, gets rubbed the wrong way by their friends, that is not a typical adolescent, and that's not even a snarky adolescent. That is almost always a teenager who is suffering from depression and needs to be evaluated and treated as such. Okay, now we get to the fluoride, the fun part. So fluoride for teenagers, when we think about their mental health. Here's the thing I want you to know, most important thing I'm gonna to say to you tonight. The single most powerful force for mental health in teenagers is strong relationships with caring adults. We have proved this over and over again. It's great if there are adults in the home, but they don't have to be adults in the home. So all of you are caring adults. All of you have teenagers somewhere in your orbit. Maybe it's your kid, maybe it's your nieces or nephews or your grandchildren, maybe it's somebody you mentor, maybe it's a neighbor's kid, maybe it's somebody who works for you. When I think about how we're gonna get ourselves through and out of this adolescent mental health crisis, I don't think it's gonna be more therapy for more kids. That's actually not a practical solution. What it's gonna be is the adults who are surrounding teenagers stepping up and making incredibly powerful connections with them. Okay, so let's talk about exactly what that looks like on the ground. As a mom, I can relate to this all too well. It's easy to chalk up that prickly or spiky behavior to just being a teenager, and I've been guilty of doing that myself. Writing off moodiness, irritability, or them lashing out as typical teen behavior is such a common trap. But when you dig a little deeper, you start to realize there's often something more going on. That sharpness, whether it's aimed at parents, siblings, or even their friends, can actually be a cry for help. We tend to overlook that, thinking it's just a phase, when in reality, those rough edges can be masking something serious like depression. 
And it's so important that we, as parents and mentors, don't brush it off. I've learned that it's not just about seeing the behavior, but about stopping to ask, why? Why are they reacting like this? What's going on underneath? This really brings home the point that we need to pay attention. Sometimes, the biggest signs are the ones that look like everyday teenage attitudes. But if we're tuned in, if we're paying attention, we can step in and help before things get worse. That's where those meaningful connections come in. It's about noticing when something just feels off and having the courage to dig a little deeper. This part of the conversation really highlights the importance of paying attention. It's not always about the obvious signs. Sometimes the most critical signals are the ones that seem like everyday teenage attitudes. And that's where we come in as the adults who care about them. Taking time to connect, to ask questions, and to notice when something feels off. So it's hard when a teenager gets upset, right? It's very worrisome to see a teenager in distress. Their emotions are very powerful. They can be unsettling for the teenager and unsettling for us. Going forward, I want you to be watching for a teenager who's having a powerful emotion, and I want you to think, this is my chance to build a strong connection with that young person. Okay, I'm gonna tell you exactly what your job is, and it comes down to two words. Easy to say, hard to do. When you get to be with a teenager who is in distress in any capacity in your life, your job is to be a steady presence. That's what we try to do. Okay, why do you have to do this? Couple reasons. The first reason is that teenagers are watching us to know how upset they should be. The nature of adolescent emotions is that they're very, very potent. They're actually more powerful than the emotions little kids have and they're more powerful than the emotions adults have. So once a young person hits like 12, 13, 14, their emotions start to become very, very amplified. It's just a neurological phenomenon. And so they take things in and they get very upset and then they bring them to us and they're watching to see if we get as upset as they do. We can't. This is where we have to be a steady presence. Because here is why. If a teenager has a breakup or fails something or doesn't get something they desperately want and they're incredibly upset about it and they bring it to us and we get just as upset as they are, the way they take that in is, ah, oh, I thought this was like a 15 year old size problem and apparently this is a 52 year old size problem, right? We don't wanna give them that impression. We want to help them keep it in bound. The other reason why we want to be a steady presence in the face of adolescent emotionality and this is how we're gonna build our strong connections with them is that our ability to tolerate distress in teenagers is actually the very thing that builds their ability to tolerate distress in themselves. Okay, why do teenagers need to be able to tolerate distress in themselves? The main reason I will give you at this point is that being able to tolerate distress, knowing that one can get upset and find one's way through it, is actually what makes teenagers independent in the world. A teenager who knows that they can get into a situation that is difficult and uncomfortable and find their way, whether it's they sign up for a class and they don't like the class, or they go do something for the summer that turns out to be lousy. If they know they can sign up for all sorts of things and try out all sorts of things, and if they get there and it's not great, they've got themselves, they can do all sorts of things. Teenagers who don't have that confidence in themselves, don't believe that if I get into a bad situation, I can get myself through it, actually end up on very narrow paths. They can do very little. They need to be guaranteed comfort, which is something we can almost never guarantee. So part of why, actually mostly why, we wanna help teenagers learn to tolerate and work their way through distress is so that they can actually have autonomy in the world. Okay, so when psychologists get to this business of helping teenagers tolerate distress and really thinking about what it involves, we actually think about it as a two-part process. So just to recap, we can't prevent distress in teenagers, we can't make it go away quickly, we can't help them regulate, and the regulation actually is two-sided. Sometimes we help teenagers regulate by expressing their emotions, and sometimes we help teenagers regulate by taming their emotions, by bringing them back down to size. 
Now, psychologists have always put these on equal footing. We consider these to be equally valuable. I will tell you right now, the culture is very heavily weighted to the expression side of things. And one of the ways this comes up in my world right now is that I'm often doing interviews, and often in the interviews, I'll get a question from the interviewer, like, how do you get teenagers to talk about their emotions, right? That there's a heavy interest in getting teenagers to talk about their emotions, and there's value, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But whenever I'm asked this question, I always feel like I'm brought back to a meeting literally 20 years ago when I was enormously pregnant with my oldest child. Um, I was about to deliver her. I was in a clinical meeting with a senior colleague. I was about to go on maternity leave. We were like wrapping up, putting stuff in our bags, almost out the door when my senior colleague stops me and she's like, um, Lisa, do you want me to tell you how psychologists mess up their kids? <laughs> And I was like, yes, I do. I know exactly what you're talking about. And she said, they talk about feelings too much. They talk about feelings too much. The kid's upset, and the psychologist's parent is standing there saying, oh, you're having a very big mad feeling. You want to talk about that feeling? And what she said is, there comes a point where you say to your kid, all right, you've been upset for a little while. What's going to help you feel better? And in that, she really summed up in this kind of throwaway phrase, like, sometimes expressing helps, and if it doesn't, what's going to help you feel better. So expressing and taming, working in tandem. Okay, so that's our job. So we're going to be a steady presence. We're going to help teenagers express feelings. We're going to help teenagers tame feelings. All right, so how do we help teenagers express feelings? So for me, whenever I come up to the question of how do we help teenagers do X, right, whatever the X is, I always start with, well, left to their own devices, how do teenagers do X? Like first you watch them do their thing and then you help. So teenagers are great. They use all sorts of strategies for expressing. Often, they will use language. They will just come up to us and say, I am angry, I am upset, I am frustrated, I am unhappy. What it's important for us to remember is, this is what we want them to do. And I think that it's easy to lose track of that. And I can say as a mom at 9 o'clock at night, sometimes it's easy for me to lose track of that, right? If like I'm like, in theory, I know this is great. At 9 o'clock at night, I have a kid standing in front of me saying, hi, I'm angry, upset, frustrated, unhappy. Usually I'm like, really? Like, now? <laughs> right? Like, okay. So we want to remember this, that actually verbalization is the high art of expression. And the other thing for us to remember, and this is key, mostly all they want is empathy. Most of the time when a young person comes our way and lays their feelings before us, We've all learned the hard way. They don't want advice. They don't want suggestions. They don't want questions about why they didn't do something else. They mostly want us to say, I'm so sorry. That stinks. I wish that hadn't happened. So when they're verbalizing, that's our strategy. The other way that teenagers express emotions is non-verbally. And I will say, you learn a lot when you write a book. It really makes you dig into the research. It really makes you synthesize things. It really makes you think. And for me, the biggest lesson that I took from writing this book is to have a much wider and more appreciative lens for what constitutes nonverbal, healthy expression. Teenagers do this in all sorts of ways. And I'll tell you two examples that were handed to me week before last. And it was two moms, different moms, and they were actually both talking about their sons. And they both gave me nonverbal examples. And what we know, this is not entirely surprising, we tend to cultivate girls to talk more about emotions and boys less so. So not entirely surprising these examples came as they did. But the first example, the mom said, she was describing her high school boy, and she said, oh, there's this problem, like his schedule got too busy, and it's turned out to be an issue because he used to come home from school and blow off steam by playing basketball for an hour, and then he could do his work. And I was like, there it is, right? come home from school, blow off steam, express the distress of the day, playing basketball, highly adaptive, and then sit down to his work. And then the other mom was talking about her 12-year-old, and it was a difficult divorce situation. And the little boy was upset, and rightly so. And he came to his mom, and he said, is there something I can break? <laughs> and, and she gave him something. She found something. And I'm not proud of this, but I can tell you two years ago, I would have been like, oh, I don't know about that. You know, and now I'm like, brilliant, right? Brilliant. The boy is, doesn't have the words. He wants to express. He's asking permission. He doesn't want to do it wrong. 
And so I have come, and I think we should all come, to be vastly more appreciative of all of the ways that kids express emotion that brings them relief and does no harm, and to not so much always feel like, until you tell me what's wrong, I can't help, right? I think sometimes that's a transaction that isn't necessary. All right, then there's the business of helping teens tame emotions. And again, before we get into our part in this, let's think about their part in this. Here's what I really have come to appreciate. Teenagers are really good at taming their own feelings. Their main strategy, I would say most of the time or often, is to use distraction. The teenagers will get a feeling back down to size by distracting themselves. I will tell you, I have come around on distraction. I, I didn't think about it that much prior to the pandemic. And to the degree that I did, if somebody had said to me, like, what do you think about distraction? I would have thought, oh, well, distraction is bad and focus is good. Like, what else is there to say? Okay, then comes the pandemic and we all spend a year and a half distracting ourselves as much as we absolutely can just to get through the whole thing, right? Which is a good strategy when you're trapped. Then here we are post-pandemic and I'm newly observant of all of the ways that all of us use distraction actually to regulate our emotional equilibrium. For me, I would say probably the most constant example is um, when I'm writing and I'm like, say, maybe working on a paragraph and I hate the paragraph and the more time I spend with it, the more I hate it and I'm getting frustrated and I'm getting close to slamming my computer shut. But if I just do a little internet shopping just for a few minutes, <laughs> right, I can go back to that paragraph and we can find our way through it, right? We do this all the time. Teenagers do this all the time. What I can tell you is if you start to notice distraction in your own life, I promise you, you're using it and start to honor it in your own life. If you ever need to talk with a teenager about their distraction, you're gonna have a much better conversation because usually we walk up to these conversations like you shouldn't be distracting. And what I've come to appreciate is it's not the distraction, it's the dosing, right, for any of us. And that makes for a better conversation with teenagers. The other place I will say we can help teenagers is sometimes to offer them distractions. And this also seems strange, but here's how we think about it as psychologists. Talking about feelings works until it doesn't. And one thing we know happens is that sometimes any one of us, but a teenager may, start to talk about the feeling or a feeling that's painful, and the more they talk, actually, the worse they feel, that they sort of start to spin and dig into that feeling. Our technical term for this is rumination. A gross but um, actually quite accurate metaphor for this is picking at an emotional wound, like just doesn't heal, getting worse as you go. And the number one solution for rumination is distraction, actually changing one's mental channel. Now, if this is your kid, or this is the teenager you're making a strong connection to, and you notice they are spinning, 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 here's how I would recommend you introduce the idea of distraction. Say something like, okay, usually talking helps, but the more we're talking, the worse you seem to feel, so this isn't working today. Let's do this. Let's come back to this tomorrow. I will find you, you know, when are you free? When am I free? I'm going to find you tomorrow and I'm going to ask you about this. In the meantime, is there something else you could do with your mind? Something that will pull your mind away from this just to give you a break. So getting them to change their mental channel, but making it clear you're not minimizing or dismissing or shooing it away. You're just going to come back to it. What is quite remarkable is that it is very rare in my experience that when you come back to the thing 24 hours later, the teenager is like, yep, it is still every bit as bad as I thought it was. Usually 24 hours brings things down to size. The last strategy I wanna think with you about is teenagers taming emotions by comforting themselves. Teenagers are great at this. And one of my favorite things to do is collect from teenagers what they do to help themselves feel better when they're upset. And they do a whole bunch of different stuff. They will listen to happy music, music that sort of improves their mood. They will take showers, they will go for runs. They will cuddle with their pets. That's probably the number one answer I hear, rolling around on the floor with a dog. But they also do quirky things. And I hear with surprising frequency, teenagers say things like, oh, I, I go collect all of the blankets in the house and I put them on a single bed and then I like burrow in. Okay, brings relief, does no harm, good by me. So teenagers comfort, them, comfort themselves, which then brings to what we can do, which is we can comfort teenagers too. And again, it may not be that they want to talk. And again, we have to widen the lens of how we help teenagers with their emotions. And if they're not in the mood to talk or talking isn't helping, 
we have an entire second category of how we help them. And taming through comforting is a beautiful thing. Here's the thing I want you to know about comforting a teenager. It often doesn't take so much. The reality for teenagers is that their emotions are more powerful, and this is true both of their negative emotions, but also of their positive emotions. And I don't know if you remember, but I remember being a teenager and like pleasures being so vivid. Like what I remember when I was 15, I had a, a job as a bus girl because I wanted to buy myself a car and I made enough money to buy myself a $900 1979 Volkswagen diesel rabbit in 1986. It was white. I loved it and it was mine. And I grew up in Colorado and I have such vivid memories of um, driving that car in the beauty of Colorado with the windows down and music playing and like thinking about it now, like I can remember it was like, I was like vibrating with delight at 16. At 52, I cannot recapture that, right? Like I just drive, <laughs> I go places. But if you can plug into that, you can remember that the teenager in front of you who's upset, who may not want to talk and may need comfort, it can be things like, do you want takeout from your favorite place? Or do you want me to go get the dog? Or do you want to go watch Phineas and Ferb together, right? Little things go a long way with teenagers and we don't want to underestimate that. Okay, so here's where I'm going to wrap up. We are in an adolescent mental health crisis. There is a lot to worry about. But I want to go back to the one thing, the one thing that I want you to remember from tonight, which is the single most powerful force for adolescent mental health is strong relationships with caring adults. You are all caring adults, and I am so grateful that you've spent this time with me to think about teenagers. Thank you. That's why I'm so excited about what the Baker Nord Center is doing and how events like the Cleveland Humanities Festival are making these conversations accessible to everyone. It's not just for academics or people with fancy degrees. This is about all of us as human beings trying to figure out how to live well and understand each other in an increasingly complex world. So yeah, when I hear people question the importance of the arts and humanities, I just want to say, look around, look at the world we're living in. If we ever needed to understand each other, if we ever needed empathy, compassion, and deep reflection, it's right now. And that's exactly what the arts and humanities provide. It's not just about knowing more, it's about feeling more, connecting more, understanding more. Wellness, wow, what a buzzword, huh? It's everywhere these days. And if you're anything like me, you've probably had moments where you roll your eyes at the idea. Because let's be real, wellness has been turned into this Instagram-worthy perfect little package, smoothie bowls, yoga retreats, and positive vibes only. But can we be honest for a second? Wellness isn't always cute. It's not just about feeling good or looking like you've got it all together. For me, wellness has been messy. It's been about figuring out how to cope with real stress how to manage the anxiety that creeps up at 3 a.m., how to keep going when everything feels like it's too much. And if you're a parent or work with teenagers or even just no one, you get what I'm talking about. Because for them, wellness looks totally different. Teenagers don't need a wellness retreat. What they need is a way to manage their emotions, to understand their mental health, and honestly just survive school, friends, social media, and everything else life is throwing at them. Wellness for a teen isn't about achieving a state of zen. It's about learning how to handle the chaos, how to bounce back from the inevitable stress and setbacks. Let's talk about the reality we're all living in. Teenagers have had it rough these past few years. The pandemic, it hit them hard. I don't think we talk enough about just how much was taken away from them. Social connections, school, their sense of normalcy. Now that things are starting to get back on track, there's still this lingering weight. Anxiety, depression, isolation, they're all through the roof. And wellness, 
it looks a lot like trying to make sure they don't feel like the world is caving in. But here's the tricky part. We adults often get so caught up in trying to fix things for them. We want to swoop in and make it better. But wellness isn't about erasing their struggles. It's about teaching them how to handle those struggles. It's about showing them that bad days are part of life and that it's okay to feel down sometimes. You know, I've learned that wellness isn't a destination. It's a process. It's about resilience. It's about getting knocked down and knowing you can get back up. And this is where we come in, right? As parents, teachers, mentors, or even just concerned adults in their lives, we've got to model that resilience. We've got to show them that wellness doesn't mean never feeling bad. It means being able to manage when you do. So yeah, this year's festival theme hits close to home for me because when we talk about wellness, we're not just talking about spa days and relaxation. We're talking about giving teenagers the tools they need to survive and thrive in a world that can feel overwhelming. We're talking about real life wellness, emotional, mental, physical, the kind that equips them to handle whatever comes their way. Ah, teenagers, if you've ever raised one or been around one for more than five minutes, you know it's a journey. Let's just put it that way. They're emotional, unpredictable, sometimes downright impossible to understand. And honestly, they're also kind of amazing. But here's the thing that's really struck me as a parent, or even just as someone who spends time around teenagers, they're not just angsty or moody for no reason. They're going through this massive transformation. And sometimes it feels like they don't even know what to do with all those feelings themselves. And the challenge for us, it's figuring out how to be there for them without making it worse. Let me tell you, there have been times when I've totally lost my cool with my teen. They're upset, I'm upset, and suddenly it's like we're both spiraling into this emotional vortex. But the more I've thought about it, the more I've realized that what they need most in those moments isn't for me to have all the answers. They just need me to be there, to be that steady presence, the calm in their storm. That's not easy though, is it? Because when a teenager is throwing all their emotions at you, anger, frustration, tears, it's hard not to get swept up in it. But what I've come to understand is that when we freak out with them, we're just amplifying their emotions. They're looking to us to see how big a deal this is. And if we're just as upset, they think, oh no, this is way worse than I thought. But if we can stay calm, even if we're freaking out on the inside, it helps them see that they can handle it. I think that's what Dr. Demore's work really speaks to. It's not about controlling teenagers or forcing them to behave the way we want. It's about giving them the tools to manage their own emotions. And honestly, that's a relief because trying to control a teenager, good luck with that. But helping them learn how to self-regulate, that's something we can actually do. So yeah, when we talk about raising connected, capable, compassionate adolescents, it's not about making sure they're perfect. It's about being there, showing up, and giving them the space to figure things out with our support. Because in the end, they're not just learning how to be independent, they're learning how to handle life. And isn't that what we all want for them? As we wrap this up, I just wanna leave you with one thought. Connection isn't about having all the answers or being the perfect parent, teacher, or mentor. It's about showing up, being there, even when the conversations are tough even when they're not talking at all. Sometimes the most powerful thing we can do is listen and create a space where they feel seen without judgment. We're living in a time where the pressure on teenagers is greater than ever. And that means the role we play in their lives is more important than it's ever been. So let's commit to being that steady presence, to asking the right questions, to really listening. The way we connect with them now can shape who they become tomorrow. And hey, 
If tonight's conversation resonated with you, or if you've been dealing with similar challenges, don't forget to comment below. I'd love to hear your stories, your thoughts, your struggles, and make sure you hit that like button and subscribe for more conversations like this. Because let's be real, we all need a little more guidance when it comes to raising the next generation. Let's keep this conversation going.